Good evening, everyone. Um, I want to. Uh, I have the honor of welcoming you all uh, to a very special program. Advent Hope is uh, very lucky to welcome the Weimar University Choir and Orchestra. Um, and we are so happy to have some regular attendees and guests in the audience. Um, so before um, um, I introduce um, the next person, um, let's bow our heads for an opening word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the blessing of the Sabbath and for bringing us uh, to the end of another week. We ask that you fill this space with your Holy Spirit. Um, may this music lift our minds up to heaven and the joys that are to come. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, Fernando Martins is the uh, chair of the music department at uh, Weimar, and we're so happy to have you. Thank you, Rachel. I've known Rachel for over 10 years now since Tennessee. Uh, I had hair at that time. <laughs> but I'd like to thank you for having us here. I'd like to thank Samantha for organizing everything for us. Thank you so much. And our uh, people that have, that have helped with this supper as well and our host tonight. Who join me, me is uh, Mr. Andres Mendoza. He's our uh, orchestra director. Mr. Javier Gonzalez, our uh, choir director. And Dr. David Chin, uh, one of our faculty in religion at Weimar. Uh, as we begin, I'd like to read a quote by Alan White that's found in the book Education. The history of the songs of the Bible is full of suggestion as to the uses and benefits of music and song. Music is often perverted to serve purposes of evil, and it thus becomes one of the most alluring agencies of temptation. But, rightly employed, it is a precious gift of God, designed to uplift the thoughts to high and noble themes, to inspire and elevate the soul. Our desire here tonight is not to bring attention to ourselves, but to use music to uplift God and lift up Christ. So as we start this evening, I'd like to have one more word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here together, for traveling mercies, for the opportunity to congregate with our brothers and sisters in a different location. Lord, tonight as we play music, as we hear Dr. Shin speak, I ask that your Holy Spirit may be made present here, that your angels may abide, that the music may invite their presence, and that we may leave this place looking more like Jesus. In his name we ask, amen.
Well, good evening. Happy Sabbath. I want to thank Advent Hope for joining us, for joining us, for inviting us this evening, and uh, for joining us as we as we worship the Lord in song. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the Sabbath hours that are now upon us, and the reminder of creation and our recreation back to the image of God that we can't make ourselves holy, but we can rest in the assurance that it is only God and God alone that can make us holy. And as we pause for a few moments this evening to reflect on heavenly themes, we pray that the Holy Spirit that inspires would also be the Spirit that instructs. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever wondered what billionaires do on a daily basis? Well, here's one billionaire, Warren Buffett, spends as much as 80% of his working day reading a minimum of five to six hours every day. He doesn't have to do this, but he loves to read. And this is what he told a group of MBAs at Columbia University read 500 pages like this every day. That's how knowledge works. It builds up like compound interest. All, you, all of you can do it, but I guarantee not many of you will do it. He comes out with a book list every few years and people take his recommendations. But this evening I wanna read the greatest book recommendation in history. You know where it is? Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15. The book endorsement of Jesus Christ. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Jesus gives a book endorsement to those that are living in the end. And this is the greatest book endorsement. Amen? If Jesus says, read this book, I don't care what Warren Buffett says. The book of Daniel. Notice what's embedded within his book endorsement of the book of Daniel. Number one, Jesus stated that Daniel was an inspired prophet who had written a trustworthy book. There's historical critical scholars, liberals, that say that the book of Daniel was written at a later time because they cannot believe in predictive prophecy. They say it's a myth, it's not a reality, it's not trustworthy, and it's not inspired. But if you believe in Jesus, 
you can believe that the book of Daniel is trustworthy because he said Daniel, the prophet. Number two, the book of Daniel should be read and studied. Our evangelical brothers and sisters say that the book of Daniel shouldn't be read. It can't be understood. Jesus said, read it, especially if you're living in the end. And number three, the book of Daniel's messages are relevant and practical for end time living. There's 12 chapters in the book of Daniel. It's divided into two genres, prophecies and stories. The stories, there's eight of them. And six of the stories are characteristics that we are to seek to emulate as the prophecies are being fulfilled. And two of them are characteristics that we are to seek to avoid as the prophecies are being fulfilled. I want to take just one little vignette from one of the stories in Daniel chapter 1, which lays the foundation for the whole of the rest of the book of Daniel. If there's no Daniel chapter 1, if he went into that Michelin star buffet, imagine, poofy hats, all these chefs are chopping it up on the walk, and if Jesus would have said, not Jesus, it's been a long day, if Daniel would have said, when in Babylon do as the Babylonians do, give me that camel sandwich, there would not be a book of Daniel. A prophetic book begins with diet. Now in Daniel chapter 1 verse 9, the Bible says, Now God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. Daniel goes in to ask to go on a plant-based diet. And this escargot dining, pork eating, Babylonian heathen likes this plant-based eating guy. Respect and affection for Daniel. Now, I've met people that have extremely high standards on lifestyle and diet that don't have high EQ. I remember I'm going through my journey. I didn't grow up vegetarian. I liked my bulgogi, you know what I'm talking about? And so I'm going through my journey and I'm figuring things out and I went to this potluck and you know, you try the best you can when you're going through, and I don't ask for the ingredients. So I pile my plate up and I sit with this brother that had extremely high standards. And I'm about to eat my food. And he said, David, you about to get mad chicken disease. It had eggs in it. And I said, come on, man. And he goes through this whole thing about Frankenstein chickens and all these hormones that are pumped into chickens and all these types of things. You can get E. coli, salmonella. I don't know what he was talking about. And I said, come on, bro. We can't go around like we're baptized in lemon juice. Here's a plant-based eater, Daniel, that is likable. He had emotional intelligence. They're not mutually exclusive. This Babylonian camel sandwich eating, escargot dining, Babylonian pagan likes this guy. Who's Daniel the type of in the end? By the way, Daniel means God is my judge. Laodicea means a people judge. Daniel is a type of God's people living in the end. And it's not just enough to know the truth. You got to live the truth. Be a loving and lovable Christian. So he goes in and asks to be on this plant-based diet in Daniel chapter 1, verse 10. But he responded, I'm afraid of my Lord the King was ordered that you eat this food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the other youths your age, I'm afraid that the king will have me beheaded. In other words, Daniel, if you go on this plant-based diet, it has far-reaching implications. 
I could be executed. But he says, you know what? I like you, Daniel. I really, really like you. And even though my head may be on the chopping block, let's try it. And you go on your weird plant-based diet, and let's see what happens. This guy put his life on the line for this weird vegetarian. Emotional intelligence. Another lesson that comes out of Daniel chapter 1 is about temperance, because the Bible says that God gave Daniel understanding in all visions and dreams. In other words, if we're going to understand the prophecies of Daniel, you've got to practice the temperance of Daniel. Now, a number of years ago, when I was in college, I went to Africa, and I don't know what it is about my blood type, but I got all chewed up with mosquitoes. Welts all over my body, it was driving me insane. Even those, those mosquitoes in the airport, I mean, I came back a hot mess. It was around December, there was a flu going around. I started getting flu-like symptoms. And like your average male, I'm allergic to needles in hospitals. And so I waited and waited. Finally, day six, it became unbearable felt this overwhelming impression, you need to go to the hospital tonight. I go to the hospital. Fortunately, that night, on call, was a physician that had been to Africa. He took one look at me. He said, I'm not going to wait for the blood test to come back because it take three to four days, and you may be dead. He said, at the top of my list, I think you have malaria. He educated me very quickly as to what malaria it was. A mosquito bites you and leaves a gift, how nice, a parasite that incubates in your, red, in your liver and then goes from red blood cell to red blood cell and then bursts. And I had a strain of malaria, I find out later, that was falciparum, and sometimes it kills you after seven days, day six. And so he puts me on these crazy dosages of quinine, and obviously I made it, but my constitution was broken. And before that, typically in school, I'd done all right. But suddenly I'm not getting the concepts anymore. And over the period of a decade, even in ministry, pastored for a little bit, I'd preach, I'd be exhausted and wiped out over the weekend. And suddenly, in my devotions, I read this quote from Ellen White. She says, there are some who would be benefited more by abstinence from food for, ugh, for food a day or two every week than by any amount of treatment or medical advice. To fast one day a week would be of incalculable benefit to them. Councils on diet and food. Now, just in case you don't take that into consideration, this is from Johns Hopkins University. Actually, no, never mind. This is from National Institute of Health. Just as good. All right, here we go. Fasting has been shown to improve biomarkers of disease, reduce oxidative stress, and persevere, preserve learning and memory functioning, according to Mark Madsen, senior investigator at the NIH. Matson has also researched the protective benefits of fasting to neurons. If you don't eat for 10 to 16 hours, your body will go to its fat stores for energy, and fatty acids called ketones will be released into the bloodstream. This has been shown to protect memory and learning functionality, says Matson, as well as slow disease processes in the brain. Now, it's interesting because in Daniel chapter 10, he also fasts. So, Chronic fatigue, my brain isn't functioning. I decide to fast one day a week for 24 hours. And this is what I did. I would fast breakfast to breakfast. I would eat breakfast in the morning, and then I would fast to the next breakfast. And in the beginning, 
all I could think about was rice. I'm Asian. And I, I persevered. And, and the results have been amazing. Now, this is descriptive, not prescripting, and please consult your doctor. And there's a fast that we all can do, which is the simple food diet. Amen? But I'm just telling you, this, this did wonders for me, and now it's been seven years. Seven years. I do it every Monday. And, and when I come out of that fast, you got to break it right, because the next day, you know, I learned by experience. I used to eat a whole bunch of food and, and then take away the benefits. But I break it very simply. Eat some applesauce and some dates. And I tell you, when I eat that, it's like, oh, amazing. And I go into class and I hit this high. And my students are like, what's gotten into him? But I tell you, the quintessential search of my life has been recovery. Because in pastoral ministry, they say it only hurts on Monday for Sunday preachers. But for Adventist preachers, it hurts, it hurts on Sunday. And Derek Morris would indicate that after he came out of Sabbath on Sunday, he hit a little bit of a depression. And I tried all sorts of things. And typically, what do we do when we recover? Comfort food, the tub of ice cream. And when we're eating that kind of things, what do we do? Click. And you're not eating broccoli and watching 3ABN. It's junk. And we're like, oh, I deserve this. But what I found is that the key to recovery is not self-indulgence, it's self-denial. Now, there's an important quote in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, now, this is in Romans chapter 12. Now, in Romans chapter 1 through 11, he's just gone over the mercies of God. How you can't earn it, how you can't buy it, how you can't mer meritoriously attain it. Has God been merciful to you? Has he given you chance after chance, opportunity after opportunity? I would have given up on me. So here he says, after going through the gospel, how you can't buy it, how you can't earn it, he says, I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies. He didn't believe in the dichotomy between body and soul. He said, because of what God has done for you, I'm giving you this, my body, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. And he says, which is your reasonable service? It's not legalism. It's not irrational. He says, it's reasonable. In other words, it's your response to the mercies of God. I don't believe in righteousness by veganism. I don't believe in righteousness by, ve by vegetarianism. But the reality is, if you have been touched by the grace of God, your response is, Lord, I'm giving you this, the best version of this. If I go home, and I have a six-year-old and three-year-old, and my wife's like, honey, I've had a crazy day. Kids have been driving me bananas. I haven't been able to wash the dishes. Would you mind washing them for me? And I said, honey, is this a divorce issue? She'd be like, what? Are you crazy? Have you lost your mind? Of course not. I said, well, then I don't want to do it. Next day, comes around. She says, honey, I haven't been able to get to the laundry. Would you mind fold folding it? I said, honey, Divorce issue? She's like, no. I said, well, then I don't want to do it. Every single thing she asks. Divorce? Well, I don't want to do it. How long is that marriage going to last? Well, God has feelings too. 
And sometimes he asks us to do something that pleases him. And we're like, is this a salvational issue? Well, then, I don't want to do it. Bare minimum. If you've been touched by the mercies of God, you say, Lord, I'm giving you this. Not in order to earn my salvation, but because of the response to the God of heaven that emptied his vault in the gift of Jesus Christ and poured out all of heaven for me. And we say, Lord, because of that, this is the least I can do. Amen. Listen as the choir sings, my Jesus, I love thee, which really articulates our response to God. We love him because he first loved us.
The Bachelor of Music program at Weimar University is a program designed to teach students to serve others through music. Music is a calling from God. Music is 
part of my DNA is who I am. Music is a way to express. To express thoughts and feelings, very deep ones. It's how we communicate the things that can't be spoken, but that also can't remain silent. And most importantly, it's a way in which I can glorify God in a way in which I can worship Him. I chose Weimar University for the sole reason that I realized the true value of Christ-centered education and Christ-centered music. It is a place where I can receive an education that is mission-focused, not necessarily performance-focused like many other options that I was looking at. Right now it is the only uh, school that tries to follow the blueprint of true education that has a music program. Our performance ensembles have many opportunities to share the work that we do here. Last year we had our university orchestra traveling to Japan and this year we have our choir going to New Zealand to reach others. Among those things, we also have opportunity to reach people in our community through our TCI program, as well as opportunity to reach people that come and visit our campus that are participating in the New Start and the Depression Recovery Program. And the students who are involved in the music program get to actually interact with these patients and serve them. So you have tons of playing experience. You get to touch so many lives. After I leave Weimar, I might be a music teacher. I also might be a concert pianist. They also may be able to be a composer and compose music that uplifts God and brings healing to the mind and the spirit. What we want to do is open the door for those who study this um, uh, main area of study of evangelism and be able to connect our musicians to churches to be music ministers. There are so many options. We'll see where God leads. The music program is accredited. You will graduate with an accredited degree at Weimar University. You should choose Weimar University if you're looking for a Christ-centered education. If God is calling you to be a Weimar, you should be here. Ours is not only Christ-centered, but it's going back to that original blueprint that was entrusted to us to share so that we may be effective as we share the three angels message to a dying world by using your music and your voice that God has given you uniquely to create, to reform, and to heal a hurting world. Johann Sebastian Bach, the great grandfather of sacred music, who said, music should be to the glory of God and the refreshment of the spirit. Has your spirit been refreshed tonight? Amen. Especially as we begin the Sabbath hours. And these are just a few bold side portraits that we share. Can you imagine the day when we arrive before the throne? And we get to sing the song of the Lamb. Amen? Has anyone here ever heard that song? Do you know the song? Do you know the tune? Have you heard the tune? I haven't either. You know what that means? You're invited to choir rehearsal. It's true. We will have to learn that song of the Lamb. And do you know who will be at the head of the choir? the Lamb Himself. Picture it right now in your mind. There on that crystalline sea with the redeemed, with those who are now sleeping, together singing the song of the Lamb. What a day of triumph that will be. It will make this sound like nothing. And this 
is again just a picture of what heaven will be like. And this is the mission that we have at Weimar University, to use this arm of the gospel to bring light into the darkness. Because if you want to tell me right now that Jesus isn't coming, look at the world around you and tell me he's not coming. Christ is coming. He is on the move. And he's calling his people to stand and wake up. Because he's given us the message. There are people that are enveloped in darkness right now. And they don't know how to deal with the darkness because they have no hope beyond that darkness. They don't have the message of truth. But you do. I do. We all do. And what is the message? That Jesus is coming. Right? That there is hope beyond the darkness. That it is through struggle that we end up climbing the ladder to victory. There are so many who need to hear this message. And all of you have been given an instrument. Did you know that? When God created you, he created us with an instrument. We are instruments of his agency. And what is the, me what is the mission? What is the message he sent us with? One word, go. Don't sit where you are. If you know this, get up and go. With whatever gifts the Lord has given you, use that voice and that instrument to proclaim his glory and that great hope. Last year, the orchestra was able to go to Japan to bring that light. And this next summer, our choir will be going over to New Zealand, actually one of the more secular countries in the world right now. We need to be the light in the darkness. If you go to Acts chapter 4 <clears throat> and you read that experience. When Peter and John, who have been imprisoned, come back to the company of believers, they're rejoicing. And obviously they're rejoicing because they've been released from prison. But more so than that, they rejoice because they were suffering the sufferings of their master. Can you imagine rejoicing because you suffer? Maybe it's something we should learn. It's that last part of the story that we need to learn. Because Christ told us that if we are to follow him, we must take up our cross. And they came back and they were rejoicing, rejoicing and rejoicing. And what did they do? The company of believers, they prayed together. And after they prayed, what happened? Verses 30 and on of chapter 4 of Acts. The Holy Spirit fell down on them a second time. And what was the response when the Holy Spirit came down on them? They were of one mind and what? And one spirit. Of one heart and one mind. And after that, what did they do in response? They gave, they all gave of what they had so that no one lacked. That's the true signature of the church, the true church. When we give of what we have and share it so that God may multiply. You know, Jesus doesn't call us to feed the 5,000. He only calls us to bring our loaves and our fish. That's it. That's the faith Jesus asked for. You bring your loaves and your fish and he does the rest. He will multiply, but it begins with our desire to give of our loaves and fish to begin with. So in your programs, you'll see that there's information about the music program, needs that we have. Unfortunately, in this world, the way it works, we need money to get things done. But who is the owner of all things? God is the owner of all things. But he expects us like the company of believers, to be as he was, giving of all he had so that others could be saved. And so we need you to join hands with us in this mission of going into the world, of proclaiming the light and the hope of Christ's coming, of the three angels' messages that need to go to a dying world because it's time to get ready to go home. Amen? It's time to get ready to go home. And I hope it happens soon.
I believe it's happening soon. And so, whatever loaves and fish the Holy Spirit puts on your heart to give, you can use the QR code there on the envelope. You can mail it in. You can uh, leave something with us this evening. There'll be bas baskets here at this door and leaving to the two doors in the back where you can leave your envelopes if you wish. And if you want to talk to us about where you believe we should go to shine that light, tell us so we can go. Because this is not about being selective. This is about going wherever it's needed. So share that with us. Join hands with us tonight. And as we present this final great Christian anthem of our heritage, amazing grace, may the Lord bless you, keep you, and may his, may his face shine upon you as you give of those loaves and fish. Advent Hope for hosting us this evening and praise God for the 
Campus Grace. Uh, Weimar University exists to train a generation that will take the gospel to the world before Jesus comes. And I want to thank you for joining us this evening. Let us bow for prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your amazing grace, for grace that we don't deserve. We pray that you would create in us a deeper desire for you. Work in us today, both to will and to do of your good pleasure. Thank you for your presence, especially during these Sabbath hours. And we pray that the work that you've started in each one of our lives, you will be faithful to complete. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
Thank you.